I'm really pleased to be uh, speaking today to Laura Graham from the Bakers Food and Allied Workers Union in Belfast. She's a regional organiser and um, it's great to talk anyway, but one of the reasons why we're talking to you today is because a few weeks ago, you were centrally involved in what was a tremendous victory for a group of workers at the Hovis plant, which people may or may not have heard about, but it's a very, very important dispute, I think. Uh, and we wanted to talk a little bit about it. And I guess just to start with, I wondered, um, obviously these are key workers, so-called, it's a kind of a new phrase that's come out during the pandemic. I wondered the extent to which the actual experience of the pandemic and some of the things that have happened around it had an impact on the strike and you know people's willingness to take action and so on and so forth. Yeah, no, and that would be fair to say that it did um, have an impact on, on the decision that our members made and the members of Unite the Union who we were obviously uh, on strike with together. Um, but what had happened in the lead up to um, you know the pandemic and stuff like that, for about the last three to four years, each pay talk every year was getting very close to strike action. We, you know, we had done a ballot for industrial action each year, probably for three or four years, but it always had, had got across the line before any action had taken place. Um, and on uh, early 2020, before the pandemic had hit, we were actually 48 hours away from all out strike action whenever we got a deal done um, at that time. What then happened in pay talks this year was employees just got a sense of, we have worked through a pandemic. We've had to put ourselves, our families at risk by coming into uh, our place of employment uh, to make sure food goes out to supermarkets into people's homes um, and we're just not accepting it anymore and I feel that had we maybe not been through a pandemic it could have been another uh, position that we had been in for you know for the last few years where you just get them to a certain point and you know you open the door but you don't go through it well this year they went through it they tore the the door down and they burnt it in the picket line basically so that's you know the pandemic really uh, spoke to the employees as they say we know how important we are and we know what we're worth interesting very interesting so uh what was the spirit like what was the mood like how did you win really well i think it was a combination of a lot of things because i, I mentioned earlier there and i probably will touch on it a few times i think you know our union motto is strength and unity. We really showed that throughout the industrial action that we have, had, had taken um, in Hovis over in Belfast. Um, and it's a case of ourselves and Unite were, you know, so so joined together in our, our action and our resolve, our members, the reps all working together, and myself and the other um, officer from, from Unite, you know, like we were so close, we never done anything without each other. And that unity, as we talk about in, in the trade union movement, that unity, I, I believe that was the starting point of, of us all properly coming together. It wasn't one union off another union, although the employer did try those tactics and it didn't really work to their advantage. Um, but coming together, um, it wouldn't have mattered whose who's member or whose union it was. Um, I was dealing with you know, guys in Unite, girls in Unite, and so so was the Unite people that for our Becker's union members. And it's that, you know, coming together, we're all in this for the same outcome. We're all being treated appallingly by an employer, regardless of, of our, our, who's, who's, um, whose union we're in. And I think that strength and unity really shone through. Um, you know, the mood in the picket line on the first day was amazing. We actually had support from another trade union coming round. Um, there was Queen's University uh, crash workers out in strike that had come round on the first day of, of our strike action to join us. And that really uh, demonstrated to our members that you do have support. I believe the employer was trying to say that, you know, well, uh, health services, NHS has only been offered 1%. So why would you get support if you're being offered 2%, which is more than that? Um, and I suppose coming into the strike, it probably put a wee bit of... Um, a bit of doubt in people's minds if there would be support out there. But as soon as that happened on that day and we had a full picket line of members, you know, that set the mood for the 11 days thereafter. Uh, because it was, you know, it started on a Friday morning at 6am. The picket line was completely full. And 
every day thereafter that was just, you know, the mood was very strong as it went on and the companies, you know, kept offering like the rise of repay offers. That just then increased people's resolve um, and we were able to demonstrate that to the employer. So, you know, the mood in the picket line was always one of strength, um, but obviously unity as well. It had been mentioned, um, in fact, um, over here by political parties um, and down in the Irish um, Assembly down uh, in Dublin, that we also had two sides of the community coming together. You know, you had two religions and workers and also Polish workers and Slovakian workers as well. But everybody came together and showed, you know, strength that, you know, is it all within the trade union movement? And I think that was amazing to see. It was every day in the picket line was fantastic. Yeah, that's amazing. So was that unity something that was already there or was that something that was really, you know, built on by the experience of the strike? Well, we have been within Hovis and another branch where we have joint recognition. We've been building on our unity together because, you know, a number of years ago, I believe there was a divide, but we've worked, you know, from the two unions perspective and all the reps involved and our members, we've worked very hard to ensure that, you know, we need to be united. It can't be, you know, if an employer can say, we'll give a union this or, and we'll give that union something else and, and we'll pull them apart. And as I said earlier, you know, they did try to do that during the course of our strike. They were taking stories to one union and other stories to our union, but we didn't let that come between us. And I believe that that's, you know, I've talked about that um, since the strike to a lot of people that I feel that whenever you have a bond like that that's unshakable and that trust is there and it needs to be there, I think that's what, um, you know, will show how well trade unions can work together. It doesn't have to be that, you know, well, I'll not help you because you're a different trade union. You know, the unity has been there, certainly in the, in the last maybe six years, but we did have to work at it, you know. Um, but now I believe it's a bond, especially since the strike, that, um, you know, the employer's not going to shake anytime soon. Brilliant, brilliant. So what was the actual impact on of the strike in terms of, you know, why did management collapse? Why did they give in? Um, what was the kind of effect in terms of the production of, of bread, I guess, and other, and other things? And also just, it might be worth just saying what exactly the workers won. Right, well, I, th I think I would talk about the impact, you know, straight away, because what Hovis had done was had no plan in place. Um, you know, we already had to take the decision where there was nothing going in and there was nothing going out anyway. However, on the Thursday before the strike had started on Friday morning, the company brought all their lorries inside and had no production planned, um, which so they had no contingency plan for you know production across um, any shop in Northern Ireland or some overseas as well in England, Scotland and Wales. Um, so that started to be really apparent on shop shelves by about the Monday, because obviously the weekend can be quiet. Shop shelves are, are beginning to empty on a Sunday. So Hovis has got such a large percentage of the market over here, more than you know half. Um, shop shelves were empty you know like all the images that we were getting posted or i was you know going into shops myself there was no bread and the other competitors that they have over here just could not keep up with the demand that was out there because of the share that hovis has in, in the marketplace here so it was really felt throughout you know like shops in northern ireland and um, and in communities where you know people couldn't get the bread they want it um so that had an um, just to interrupt a minute there Laura, sorry. Um, how many workers were involved exactly? I haven't asked you that. Uh, involved in the strike action between the two unions, there was around 180 workers. Okay. Um, so that was everybody in production um, and dispatch and drivers involved in that. So there was no other workers um, outside of our remit who went in or, or scabbed the picket line. Everybody was um, out on strike, which was great to see. Um, but as I say, so it was really felt across um, across people's homes that they couldn't get products that they're you know normally used to buying, um, and shop shelves were you know very very empty. Um, so and then that led on to you know the company not having a, a contingency plan in place. They weren't shipping anything over because of the Brexit issue over here as well. They weren't shipping products across the water um, as they could freely do in the past. Um, so they weren't able to do that. And after a lot of, uh, you know, after a few days when we had a few meetings with the employer, 
you know, to try to resolve the issue of pay. Um, and they were still going up in these, you know, 0.1, half percent, where we were rejecting them on our members' behalf because we knew from the people on the picket line what it would take to end the strike. It got to a point where the employer, we believed, um, was arguing the point that, or they, or they had said, you know, you aren't taking this out to your members, your members might accept this. So it got to um, a week and a day after the strike had started um, and the company had offered three different offers, which, you know, we agreed in the two unions to take, you know, the best of the worst offers um, to your members to demonstrate in a ballot to the employer that it wasn't us refusing, it's our members and, you know, it's a member-led strike. Um, that was overwhelmingly rejected by um, our members on, on the picket line. Um, and that was the turning point because that very afternoon, they increased their offer. Um, so what had actually happened was we had put a pay claim in for 10.5% uh, um, and other added extras as well, increased the overtime payments and shift alliances um, as well. Um, but throughout other other hovises across you know England and uh, stuff like that in Scotland, it became apparent that there was a, a pay differential between our workers in Northern Ireland and other workers across the UK of around 10%. Um, now the employer would argue that that's not the case, but it is the case whenever you look at comparable contracts, what the employer is trying to argue is second and third generation contracts. When we look at comparable contracts, there's a pay differential of around 10%. So we were trying to close that gap and get pay parity for our workers across um, in Belfast. Um, and that's, you know, the reason why the percentage was where it was. Now, you know, that we knew we weren't going to achieve everything that we set out to achieve, but we tried to get the best that we could for our members uh, and what we believed they would accept. So they end up accepting because we were... Um, six months in to the year already, they accept a two year deal at 8% um, spread over each year. So four and four and that and also included their back pay as well. Wow, that's excellent. That's a brilliant result. So what impact has it had on the, um, on the workers themselves, that victory and the whole experience of the strike, but also maybe what, what's been the impact on you know, other industries, workers in other industries in the area, in Northern Ireland generally? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, the impact to the workers in the branch is, you know, as they would have said in the picket line, this has been the best team building exercise that we could have ever have had. We'd workers on the line, uh, on the picket line and out on strike who had been out in strike in the late 70s. You know, that was the last time that site was out in strike. It was the late 70s. Um, and, you know, they were even saying, you know, it's as good as it was then. Well, that's the Hovis line anyway. It's as good as it's always been. Um, so, you know, the workers really um, enjoyed uh, the solidarity. Do you know what I mean? That we had um, some people who probably don't really, you know, come into contact with each other because of shifts work and uh, night shift or day shift. Um, and getting to see those people and spend a bit of time with them again on the picket line really brought people together. So... It, it strengthened everybody's uh, position as well, where they're saying, you know, we're not going to go back in and just take any nonsense off the company. If you do anything to us, and that was made very clear to the employer when we did end the strike, um, we won't put up with any nonsense. You know, it doesn't have to be about pay. If you just begin to, I'll not use the words, but it was just, you know, if you just begin to muck about, then we will ballot our members and be back out because, you know, the passion's there within the membership to get back out. They did sort of laugh and joke that we picked the wrong sort of time. It could have been better weather. But, um, you know, I believe it strengthened that branch to something that I've never experienced in it before. Um, and everybody went back on with their heads held high. Um, and what it's done, uh, I believe, throughout the food industry anyway that we represent, is it's shown people that, you know, don't let your employer think you know, because, you know, as typically been referred to as a low paid, low skilled industry that you don't have support out there or that when, you, you know, if you take them on, you can win. Um, I know there's always an element of risk in that, but at the end of the day, just what can happen, you know, when you do win um, and how proud do you feel of yourself? You know, every member, how proud they, you know, are of, of themselves and, the, and their co-workers and other members. Um, 
is amazing. Uh, and they have, again, showed support to other strikes um, here in Northern Ireland. So it just it's even brought them, I would say, back into the trade union movement again, because you can stagnate. You can be a member 20 odd years or, or more yeah. and you can stagnate and not want to really be involved. So it's brought them back into actually want to be involved in the movement again, which I think is fantastic that that's happened too. Yeah, that's absolutely brilliant. And have you got plans, has the union got plans to think about organising more widely in the area or are there other potential um, ways that you can strengthen the union, um, you know, in, in, in Belfast and beyond? Well, what I would like to see is some kind of a national campaign for, you know, the workers in the food industry. Um, our union now believes coming out of, out of, and I know we're not out of a pandemic, but we're coming off the other end of, you know, the lockdowns and things like that that we've had in every region. Um, and there's a general consensus within our union that, you know, our workers in the food industry are now the forgotten heroes of the pandemic. They did go to work. They put their own lives at risk. Um, members of their family, their, you know, friends who they weren't allowed to see. Um, but their employers, you know, when we go in and argue that point of pay talks, aren't taking that on board. Um, it's just the case of, you know, well, they had to come to work. So, you know, what more do they want? We need to ensure that our industry is now elevated uh, out of that uh, misconception of, well, it's low paid, low skill. You just go there if you don't have any qualifications from school. So I believe a national campaign for the food industry um, and other industries as well, uh, you know, is, is really called for to get them up to the wages that they so rightly deserve. You know, I've always known I come from um, our industry, uh, um, a poultry um, industry, um, and it was always low paid. I left it on the national minimum wage. Um, we can't have that anymore. We can't have our workers on the bare minimum of terms and conditions, on the bare minimum of wages. We need to, you know, get that um, increased and show them exactly how much we know as a trade union that they all deserve. Do you feel, Laura, that, you know, this, this dispute is kind of part of something bigger? Do you feel as if there's the beginnings of, um, of union organising and a bit of a new mood going on in, amongst key workers more generally? You know, um, I was I was given um, a talk at an, another event a few weeks ago, and, and that's the word I you know. I use those kind of words. There feels like there's been a shift. There's a shift going on that I think we're going to begin seeing um, coming through, and it's going to be exciting to be a part of it. I believe, um, but it is this kind of you know the mindset of hold on, we deserve more, and you know the food industry, uh, hospitality as well. Look how they've you know been through the mill in and out of work and stuff like that. There, the health sector all deserve to be going, hold on, we know we deserve more. It's been the workers that have kept this country going, let's face it. Um, so I really feel there's a there's something bubbling under the surface um, that I think is exciting. And if we could just, you know, get that across the whole trade union movement, my goodness, it would be amazing. Thank you so much, Laura. That's been a really, really inspiring, uh, it's an inspiring story, but also the kind of plans that you outline there at the end are really, really important. And I'm, I'm really hoping that lots of people will, will listen to, um, to this interview and, and see it as a kind of example, because as you say, in the catering, in the food industry, but also across the kind of key worker sector, I think I'm certainly feeling as if the things are beginning to stir and there's, there's yeah. signs of people getting organized and, and thinking seriously about how to, uh, how to how to really improve things so thanks very much yeah. for talking to us and no uh, hope to speak to you soon no problem that's great thanks very much chris